Okay. <clears throat> Good evening. How is everybody? Good. All right. I'm sliding in by the skin of my hair, my chinny chin chin this evening. I was on a, two other Zooms today, and for some reason it deactivated my account. But we're all good. Okay. <clears throat> I see everybody's joining in with us. What time is it? 6.59. 6.59. What's going on in the world outside of, in the real world? Anybody got anything exciting to share tonight? Well, I'm sure you've seen the news about the county commissioners and the school board. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the school board is in effect suing the county commissioners. That would be correct. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that never ends well. No. Um, I, I'm not sure that that's the right way to go about things, but we'll see how that plays out. Uh, and now, Correct me if I'm wrong, the, the issue is the school board developed their budget and the recommendation. Superintendent developed the budget, um, presented it to the school board, they adopted the budget. And as we know in North and South Carolina both, that school boards are unempowered. We've talked about this, they have to then go to the funding agency, which in this case for our county school system, is the county commissioners for a city's district. It would be the, the town commissioners. But they went to them and they rejected and offered an alternative that was uh, considerably less than what the school board asked for in the superintendent's budget. And the response of the school board is to sue the county commissioners to try to force them to fully fund their proposed budget. Um, this is not used very often and not very successfully, but the, I guess the school district in Charlotte feels like they have nothing to lose because it wasn't just a matter of a few dollars. Um, how much money was it, Dr. Miraglia? It was a, quite it a was, it was a, let me see if I still have any of that correspondence. It was a significant amount of money. Um, um, $81 million. Yeah. And now what they're saying that a significant amount of that is going to directly impact principals and assistant principals and instructional staff. Yeah. It's salaries. Exactly. And bonuses. So basically what the county commissioners in effect are saying is everybody had a bad year because of COVID. We're going to have to scale back on bonuses and incentives and locally and paid positions. And raises. Yeah. And well, obviously raises in salaries. Uh, that includes raises. And so to, to get back to our, when we talked about, when we talk about finance and budgeting, the majority of your budget is, uh, is uh, in salaries is paid for from the state, but you can choose to add additional positions. You can choose locally to add bonus and salary, additional salary structures. You can add additional administrative and teaching staff. That's when we talked about Leandro will get into deeper into that and when we get to that case study, the, the argument for years is, is that wealthier districts have the ability to add 
uh, additional resources into uh, additional money in the budget to get additional personnel and to attract better and more and people and add additional teachers, reduce class size. But they choose to do that in the, through their local budget. The state funding formula only pays base salaries, doesn't pay bonuses, doesn't do raises, uh, it defines how many people you get based on a formula of how many students you have. Now districts can go in on top of that and set uh, bonus structures. Um, they can also pay stipends like for summer um, in, in order to attract and maintain teachers, for example. Um, I don't know what it is now. When I was in CMS, uh, in the two summer months, um, they paid teachers three quarters of their monthly salary for both of, of those summer months. That was the, a, uh, a bonus structure or for retention. Um, and so you got one and a half month salary for those two months. And that was a stipend that they gave to recruit and retain teachers, but that had to be paid locally. If you have an extra system, say for example, you've got a middle school and you've got 800 kids. Well, you only qualify for two assistant principals. A lot of times a district will give you a third assistant principal in order to have one for each grade level. Well, the district has to pick up the cost of that third assistant principal. Um, if you have a bonus structure based off of what we were talking last week, if you have a bonus structure based off of growth, off of student achievement, that's, that's local as well. So all those things go into the local budget. And so the county commissioners in Charlotte Mecklenburg, from what I've read, said, we, we, can't, we can't afford that this year, or we won't afford that this year. We've got some other things that we want to fund. Uh, and there was a laundry list of those, like parks and a zoo and some of those kinds of things. And so they subtracted that 81 million from the budget proposal that the superintendent presented to the board, the board then presented to the county commissioners and said, uh, we're, we're, we're not gonna fund fully what you asked for. We're not gonna fund this $81 million. I think altogether it may be a little closer to, uh, say, but seemed like close, maybe you know, between 80 and $100 million. 81 could be more than that. Bonuses are always kind of catching, trying to kind of tricky to calculate. But anyway, they're, they're only asked, but the county commissioners are just wanting a plan. Yeah. They said if, if CMS would give them a plan of action with some accountability, they will, they will yeah. fund, they will support the budget. Yeah. They, they're asking, all right, you're going to do, well, the plan would entail things like a market research about what other districts are paying. I mean, one, one of the things about paying stipends is, is the argument is, is that's to be competitive with the surrounding counties. Well, then they're asking for a study that show what are the surrounding counties paying in terms of their stipend. Um, bonuses, you know, but tied to student performance. They're simply asking for a plan as to how, how you're going to disperse this money and the need for the money. You have to show that the need and how, and then a plan to disperse it. CMS just said to the county commissioners, trust us, we know what we're doing. <laughs> and CMS response, rather than providing the plan was, is we'll just sue you to get the money. So this is really, it's always about the money, but this is really about governance. There are some board members in CMS who don't believe that they ought to have to go hat in hand to the county commissioners for anything. They believe that since they were elected that they ought to be, what they say is, is, is all to go. And the county commissioners are saying, no, we, we are the funding agency. We're responsible to voters as well. And, and you have to show us a plan of how you intend to use this money. Um, and so, as I said, as I started this uh, long-winded soliloquy to start with, Suing the county commissioners never ends well. Um, you know, that, that kind of burns all bridges between them. But uh, I know how it will go in court. It will not go well for the district because they had a plan to, because the first thing the court's going to do is refer them back to mediation to find a way to avoid a, a protracted lawsuit. And they're going to say, 
this seems like a reasonable request from the county commissioners. Now, if you submit the plan and, and they say, well, okay, but we're still not gonna give you the money, then that's a different story. But refusing to provide a plan as to how they're gonna disperse those funds, $81 million, is probably not the right thing for the school board to do. But this is kind of gonna be a litmus test. In the past, I can tell you that the county commissioners are, they're undefeated on this. Um, if, if they ask for a plan, which is standard in our business, then uh, I don't think their, their lawsuit will proceed until they come up with, and, with a plan and, and the county commissioners then reject the plan. Uh, so this is just one of those, but again, it goes to how, how, how does the budget, how, how, how do you get, go about developing and funding a budget for schools? Well, it starts with the superintendent who, who develops a budget, um, is negotiated by different board members and then adopted by the, by the, the school board and then is presented to the funding authority. That's how it has to go. Um, Again, being unempowered, that means that the, county, the, that the school board does not levy taxes in North or South Carolina. They do not levy taxes, and so they have to go to a funding authority, and they have to answer to that funding authority. So that's what this is all about, is, the, is, is who has the authority here. Um, but but in, in, a, in a larger sense, um, this kind of destroys any working relationship that these these two governing bodies might have and i guess the the notion is is they that the school board really doesn't care they're they're trying to break away and be and, and gain some power and authority in their own right except they don't have the law behind them. that that's going to be their problem the law is very clear in terms of who who controls the purse strings. all right <laughs> So let's get started for the evening. Um, I want to first of all look at our weekly schedule as we always do. Let me share my screen and we'll get started. Uh, Hi, Lynn. I more let you know that I am here at essential practice and I'll be at my house in a few minutes. Okay, we can. We can we saw you in the car, look like, and so um, just let us know when you get there. I'm going to cover a couple things. I want to cover our, our weekly assignments. Um, thank you again. You, you folks are doing a great job on your weekly assignments. Um, uh, interview administrator concerning human resource practice. We did human resources last week to, to kind of conclude that. Um, What um, I, I wanted to say about that is, again, the response that I've given back to you, every district is different. They use Apple, they use Teacher Match, they use Apple Track. That there's different, different groups that they use. Some use Indeed. Um, they use different, different platforms for teachers, but they do varying amounts of background checks prior to interviews. They require some folks have HR that does all of it. Some, the principal has to do it all. But the trick again is, is you need to know what's happening in your district. How, how does it work in your district? And remember, we have to go back to our legal basis again. Um, the principal doesn't hire anybody. They recommend to HR. HR recommends to the superintendent. The superintendent recommends to the board. The board does the hiring. And it goes in that way. Um, and so you have to remember that you can't offer people jobs uh, at the, from the, the building level because you, you do not have that authority to do that. That's the biggest mistake that you could make. Um, again, you have to be careful about the questions that you ask. You have to be consistent. Uh, you have to interview a minimum amount, all, all of those things, but you need to find out what that is. And again, on employee assistance, you need to know what your district has because um, there are certain employment rules that go along. That's the dark side of employee assistance. Is that if you have somebody who's involved in a DUI or drug possession or fails a drug test, according to what your district has in terms of employee assistance, you may not be able to take a job action against those people if they go to treatment or, or seek 
uh, rehabilitation or some, somewhere in that. You need to find out how that works in your district. Um, I, I have been involved in that myself as a principal. Um, I had a teacher who failed a drug test, but because she had sought employee assistance, she got to take a leave uh, and I could not replace her even with a long-term sub uh, and for six months, uh, which put a lot of stress on, on our building. Uh, but again, we, we had that we had that available in our district. So you need to find those kinds of things out. Um, you, you get job abandonment, people don't show up for work, but if they're, if they're under treatment somehow through your employee assistance, again, you can't take a job action against them. Usually if they don't show up for work for five days, you can terminate them, but not if they're involved with employee assistance. So you need to know what your district offers and how that is gonna affect you uh, if one of your employees either comes to work impaired or, or more or doesn't come to work, what, what your options are. Those are dependent upon what employee assistance, assistance um, benefits that your district has. Uh, those are not consistent across uh, all districts and in, in, in the states. Um, that goes district by district and you need to find out. Now, if your district doesn't offer some of those services, then you have, uh, uh, you know, it's a two, it's a double-edged sword. You can't help people, but but you have, you have more job actions that you could take if they show up impaired or don't show up at all. And I've had both to happen. But it's all again based on your what what you your your district offers in terms of your employee assistance program. So you need to know that as well uh, when when you're trying to make personnel decisions. All right, and so this week. Uh, is our Exceptional Children's Week. And so you were to interview the chair or a member of your school's intervention team. That would be SST care team, your MTSS team. Uh, this is the school-based committee that receives referral from teachers concerning students that are having academic or behavioral problems. Outline the, the official 90-day process. And we're gonna talk about that at length tonight. Um, also determine whether or not your school employs the three-tier intervention system. We're gonna talk about the legal basis behind that and how it got delayed by, by COVID, but we're back on with that now. And then attend an IEP meeting, who's in charge, how are decisions made, what role does the parent play? Now, one of the things that uh, I'll give a shout out to, uh, to Todd, that, that he was clear in his, Although the staff puts together, although the staff puts together the IAP and has all the, you know, the manifest determination, the functional behavior assessment, uh, does the DEC-5, you know, does the updated psychological, you know, does the reavow for the IAP, the decisions that that team makes, and we're going to talk about, the principal's going to talk about this, uh, have to be collaborative. Now you can't promise something your district doesn't, doesn't provide, but you're supposed to make a collaborative, the IEP team is supposed to make a collaborative decision. But the question always comes down to what the parent doesn't accept that decision. You know, these, these decisions are supposed to be, are supposed to be collaborative, but what if the parent says, no, I want, I, I want something different than that. In the end, as Todd pointed out in his, it is the legal responsibility for the LEA representative, which is usually the principal. Um, they will make the decision uh, if there's no clear consistency. Now, that doesn't mean parents won't sue you, but, but the principal is responsible to make a decision at the end of that meeting. If, if there's no end in sight, no, no kind of um, compromise available to get, to get that IEP signed, the principal makes the decision or the LEA rep, which is usually the principal, makes the decision based on the recommendation of the I, the staff, the IEP team, and the parent then has the right to appeal or sue that for that decision that was made. So in the end, uh, you want a collaborative decision, but in the end, the principal has to make that decision and you may get sued. You, you will get sued if you make the one the parent doesn't like. Uh, so that, that is the, the legal basis of how an IEP meeting, the staff puts all the paperwork together and makes the recommendation. If the parent rejects the recommendation and the 
not and, and no accommodation or no consensus can be reached, um, then the principal, the LEA rep makes that decision uh, and then is, then is eligible to be sued by the parent for relief. That's the way that goes. Todd pointed that out in his response. That's good. Um, prior to that, um, we have varying levels of, before that e EC decision is made, we have intervention MTSS. It was supposed to be fully functioning in North Carolina by last July. It's not because of COVID. Uh, Cyrus pointed out in his that he's in a high, high school in Hickory and they don't, they're, they're not up to speed yet. Um, but the, the point to remember is, is as Cyrus pointed out in his response, you, you don't have a lot of that in, in high school, but you do have some, but you still have to have a team in place. You have to have a system in place, even though most of these kids with learning and behavioral problems have been identified at the elementary and middle school level, you still have to have a process in place for high school if you have one in case you get a referral. You can't just say, well, that never happens to us or it happens so infrequently that we don't, we didn't develop a system. No, you still got to develop your system. And Dr. Caton will speak, hopefully when she gets with us, she will speak to that tonight in her presentation as a high school principal. You can't just say somebody else took care of this. You will always get students who struggle in high school as well. Um, and so you, you have to have a process in place for struggling students. So that's the thing to remember. Uh, shout out, moving on, shout out to Ashley, Claire, and Kitty who've already completed their OMA task two. Please remember, um, Ashley has uploaded hers in her Dropbox. Please make sure that you put those when they're done in your assignment Dropbox. Uh, and so since we've got folks who have completed task two, which is remember just a copy and paste of the APTEL task one, two, and three, including your actual graphic organizer of your professional growth plan, with all, but make sure you re remove all of your APTEL labels. Um, there's a, are already in our discussion board. You can see those again, Ashley, Claire, and Kitty. Um, and so excellent job on mm -hmm. task two. So that starts my part tonight. Uh, I'm going to cover task three of the OMA. We're to that point where we've got some folks ready to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and cover that now. Let me pull up my task and prompts. I've got it ready to go. All right. So for OMA task one, you pulled together all your information. Task two, you presented your professional growth plan. Now you're ready to start getting ready to uh, develop a master schedule. Now, you do not have to present this master schedule because of the, the timing. Uh, you don't have to present this to your administration. If you want to, you can. Uh, I also, also get a question, can I do a, a, a master schedule like I'm in the CTE department? Can I just do a master schedule for them? Yes, that's allowable as well. We'll let you do a partial and no, you don't have to do a whole new one. You can just change smaller parts and, and edit the one that you've got. But regardless of whether you do one for CTE or one for your whole school or whether you just edit the old one, you have to have a rationale for, for why you did it. You can't just say, here's my, here's my recommendation for the, for the master schedule. Based on what? Well, I like this. Uh, me and my friends get to, you know, get to go planning at lunch and at the end of the day. No. You must have a rationale based on either federal law, state law, board policy, performance data, EVOS, or teacher input, you must have a rationale for any suggested changes that you make to the existing schedule or as the basis for a new schedule that you've developed. You must have a rationale. So here's how we go about doing that. So the first thing we do, we assess the current scheduling procedures. Stop right there. It doesn't say assess the current schedule. It says current scheduling procedures. Are you doing your federal programs first? Then are you looking at state law? Then are you looking at local board policy? Then are you looking at performance data? And then are you gathering teacher input in that order? What's, what is the process that your school uses to start the master schedule? We want you to look at the procedures. 
because if you don't change the procedure, you won't change the outcome, the schedule itself. The product is simply uh, <clears throat> a part and parcel of the process that led to the development of it. If you want to change your master schedule, you don't just start monkeying with it. You change the procedure that developed that master schedule. That's the whole notion here. If you just start changing the master schedule, the, 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 the half of the faculty that's that's happy will now be mad and now everybody will be mad. Um, that's perhaps one of the worst things that you can do in school is come up with a bad master schedule and then start trying to change it. No, change the process that led to the bad master schedule. That's what we're, that, that's the whole notion here. All right, Ashley has a question. Um, I was actually part of creating our new master schedule just because when you're in this position, everybody's like, hey, come help. Mm -hmm. experience. So um, could I just narrate all that and narrate why the changes occurred? Like, so I don't have to recreate this from my own. No. Opinion? Okay. No. If you've been a part of this process, if you were a chair or a facilitator, or an AP or a dean or, or any of those any of those roles, or even as a faculty member of the school improvement team, that you were part of this, you just you just basically narrow that's great that that's great. Uh, Ashley, that, that's a great way to describe it. You just narrate the process that y'all went through. I mean that that's exactly what you would do. You tell us how this went, the process. That that's it. Um, I mean that that's what we're looking for. Um, what you find is, is, you know, when I would be, get called in, you know, schools that were having problems with their master schedule, you know, that, that's all I would do is t tell me how you did this. Just, just sit down and walk me through what, what you did. Um, and then what we would find is, is the problems were based on the, the process, not the, the actual product itself. So, uh, again, um, you know, that's, that, that's what we want to do. So that's excellent. That, that is, that is uh, the best way to describe that is just narrate the process. So you're going to start out with you assess your current scheduling procedure, strengths and weaknesses and areas for improvement. We're having problems with this program. We're having problems with that. We're having, we're, this is the problem that we're having, you know, but did we start with our federal programs first? Did we then look at, you know, state law in terms of class size or planning time, all of those kinds of things? Did we look at all the requirements from our locals in terms of how many minutes of this or block schedule for that or how many days or length of class, those kinds of things? Then did we match our teachers and our curricula and our students, you know, for, for best results? And then did we listen to what teachers told us? Um, did we did we align the process with what our school improvement team found? For example, if they said we you know we, we need to focus on math scores, did did we factor that in when we were building the master schedule that we might need to put more time in for math, or we not need to we might need to have longer class periods for math, or or uh, the more class periods of shorter length. One of the things that we know and and, and Dr. Dayton even, I think, referred to them as skinnies last week, where you don't meet for for for, uh, for an hour and a half every day for a semester. You meet for 45 or 50 minutes all year long. Uh, we know that we get better math, math, better math scores with our lower math students if we do it that way. Well, that's a master scheduling issue. We know that you know the, the research and data tells us that we're, we're better off to have those kids you know, for a longer period of time for that set amount of curricula, but shorter each day because of attention span issues, then cram them into a class in, on a four by four compact. Well, that's what we're talking about when, with the master schedule. Here. And even though your district, you know, the, the official position of the district may be a four by four compact, there's certain students that we identify through again, performance data, Number four on our list, our EVOS data, that tells us which of these students need to be in a math class that meets for 45 minutes all year long, rather than an accelerated class that meets for 90 minutes for, for, half, for, for half the year. That's the kind of things that we're talking about here. 
But again, we go back to our school improvement team findings. What did our what are the academic initiatives from our school improvement team? Now, remember when we had you do the app to, app cell, the first of your evidence is basically that's what a school improvement team would do. Would would dive in your PLC, dove in just like the uh, school improvement team looked at your data and came up with your most pressing need. Well, that that's basically what your school improvement team does. It doesn't do any good to come up with that most pressing need if we don't if we don't now actually integrate that into our master schedule, whatever that program or process was that you came up with. So we're going to look at that next. Alignment with legal requirements for ongoing teacher collaboration, planning, and instruction. Again, uh, PLC work, planning. Uh, all, all of those things, how much planning time? You can't add additional classes and take teachers' planning time. You say, well, you know, we, we need to add some extra classes for these kids. Well, how are we gonna do that? Well, we'll just take teachers' planning time. Well, you can't do that. You have to find a way, you have to make sure that teachers get their planning time and that they have both team and individual planning time on a weekly basis. So you have to factor that in. Then you have to look at, at your, your, your special prop, POPs programs. That's why we had you do an audit of them in task one of the OMA. What are, uh, audit is simply what are they supposed to get versus what they get. And that's the delta or the difference, that gap analysis. When, we, when we're doing that, when we're looking at those, when, when we're looking at an audit of our, of our special POPs, our federal programs, what are they supposed to get? What do they get? And how can we gap, bridge that gap through the, the, the schedule to make sure that they're getting what they're supposed to be getting? Evidence is input from faculty. That's really simple. Um, and then how that we then utilize, as, as Ashley said, we just, do a, we just do a narrative. We just tell about how we utilized all these things that we gathered to get put together, that, how that informed our process of building that master schedule. And then you put that together, you develop a new schedule or a draft of a current one again. You can edit a current schedule um, that justifies the changes. You don't have to present the school administration. I, in a formal sense, you, you would just share it with them uh, or the school improvement team. Uh, should be presented graphically in a meeting. I, I need to see it gridded off just like a regular master schedule. You explain it. But then you got it's got to be a graphic. You can't just say we're going to change these classes or that. No, I want to see a, a, a graphic of a master schedule. Um, and so that that's what you do in task three, and of course in task four you just write your comments. And we're going to get to that in just a minute. What is the rule or law on teachers that agree to teach plug-in courses? And losing a planning period. Is there anything to protect the teachers? Absolutely. Again, the, the, the operative phrase there, they have to agree to give up that planning and they're supposed to be compensated extra to do that. No, teachers cannot be forced to give up their planning to teach an extra class. That's a, that basically you're saying, I'll do my planning on my own time if you'll pay me to teach during that time but that I agree that I will have to do my planning. I won't sue you or, or file a grievance against you for not giving me my planning time, but I expect to be compensated extra for that time. Now, a lot of districts won't do that because they don't want to have to compensate extra. But no, you cannot force somebody to teach one of those gap or fill in classes during their planning time. That is, that, that is illegal. That, that they, there are protections on your planning time. That's a great question. Now, on competencies. You can do, um, you can do 12 competencies for the OMA. And then next semester, when you do the skip, you'll do the other nine. You are to do competency analysis of 12 of the 21 competencies, you know, communication, conflict management, you know, you know the list of competencies. You get to pick which 12 you want to do, any 12. Again, we're shifting more of the decision-making to you. 
So you know that there are 21 competencies. You get to pick which 12 you want to do. But now you don't get to choose if you do the 12 or not. You have to, you have to do 12. And here are here they are. Communication, change, management, customer. Now remember, this is analysis in, in, in task four where you tell us how you met these competencies. You pick 12 of these and you'll do, remember, you have to do the other nine when you do the skip next semester. So choose wisely. All right. Questions you have for me on OMA task three, what the, what the expectation is on OMA task three. It's fairly straightforward. All right, let me close that. I did not pull this up prior. I can close that as well. <clears throat> Go back here. just in case. So there is no confusion. Okay, here we go. This is what I'm talking about a graphic. See, here is the explanation. There's the rationale for what they're doing, why they did it. Here's all the things, all the bullets from the prompt from task three. Let me go start right here. See here, analysis of current schedule. There we go, all the way through. All those different bullets, alignment with the findings, all those things. Just straight down the line, the bullets, but here for prompt two, pass three, prompt two, there's your rationale, but that's what we want right there. That's the part that everybody leaves out. We want to see the graphic. We want to see the graphic. You can't just show me the graphic and say, here it is. You have to have all this, the rationale, and you have to have all your bullets from task three, prompt one, but always where we, we always fall down is on prompt two. People forget to look at prompt two, I mean, uh, of, of task three, prompt two, where it says we want to see a graphic exploration. That means show us this, okay? And this is in your example. This is a pretty straightforward example. Again, it's, it's in Blackboard Shell. So when you, when you upload task three, make sure at the end, just like at the end of the app tell, we had at the end of task three in the app tell, we had to actually see the graphic organizer of, uh, of your professional growth plan. At the end of task three of the OMA, we must see the master schedule because that's what we've been working this whole semester for is this, this piece right here. This is, this is the rabbit out of the hat. This is, the, you know, this is, what, we, this is what we did all this work for is for this, so don't forget that. All right, questions you have for me on the OMA? I'm gonna stop my share. All right, your principal, your resident principal experts have gotten a, have a program for you tonight. They've got a shared folder um, with materials on exceptional children, federal programs, um, they've got a lot of good information. I'm going to sit back and listen to them tonight, and they're going to present for you uh, what they do and what real principals do with, with these PC and intervention team programs. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kate to get us started tonight. Okay, so uh, Dr. Maraglia, you're just going to jump in when um, I have missed something or, you know, you, you know, you know what we do. We just like ping and pong off each other. That's what we do. <laughs> Can everybody yeah. see my, at my screen? Yes. And then I've got some stuff about EC and discipline also. Yes. yes. Um, so I'm, 
I'm going to start us off uh, with uh, somebody talked about MTSS, and I'm going to go into scheduling and things like that. And so I'm going to start you off with MTSS. Um, someone mentioned that the high school level about MTSS. So for us um, at our school, we are doing MTSS. Um, this is our tiered system for our school. Uh, we uh, have our problem solving team meetings uh, twice a month. Um, so this kind of tells you what we do for tier one, tier two, tier three. Uh, and I'll be very honest with you in tier three, very rare do you have any students who are tier three in high school. Um, usually your students are already identified by the time they get to high school. So you, you generally will not have any students for tier three. Um, what I did not uh, include for you uh, in, your, uh, in your folder was this is actually one of our uh, meeting, meeting agendas uh, that we had um, in September 24th. Um, you can see who was there. Uh, this is myself, my instructional coach, my school psychologist, and our instructional, I mean, our assistant principal. And we were just looking over some training that we needed to do. We were looking at our data points. The biggest thing was our contact log. If you remember, this was September, so COVID was going on strong. We had a lot of students who were not in school. Uh, we were running zero activity reports. We use, for a Canvas, we can run um, a report called a zero activity. That would show students who are not logging into Canvas at all. Uh, we determined that Monday and Wednesday from Fridays, we would do a robo call to say your student is not logging into Canvas. They're not doing anything. Uh, we did attendance robo calls. We figured all that. And we would follow up with make sure the numbers were working correctly. Um, we had a contact log that we were looking at, and I'll just look at that right quick. These are all the students that we were seeing. Um, if you see this started, you know, uh, this is, well, this didn't start. This is just, guys, we moved on. Um, some students, I'm not gonna share with the st students' names if they thought problem solving needed to, to happen because they weren't going virtual attendance or their grades were bad. So these are all the things that we were doing in March all the way, uh, of last year, all the way throughout the school year. Um, and then we got specific students. Uh, this student we knew needed home visit. You know, social worker visit was unsuccessful. So we went through specific students and um, we knew that what we needed to do uh, to make these students successful. So this is just a snippet. Um, what we said, we're gonna start running grades, create a script for failing um, students in home visits. We were gonna create a plan of success for us of the students that were not coming. Um, so uh, then we're gonna pull data um, from failed classes from fall to fall of 2020 to see what our numbers were. So this just gives you a little bit of an example of what our problem solving would look like in the high school level. Sorry, I, I, it's hard for me to navigate once all this stuff has come up, y'all, I apologize. How do I get this out of my way? I gotta get there. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, um, and I wanted to also let you see that with MTSS, to me, it focuses also on a behavior. Um, so for us, this is our behavior matrix that we did as a school. Uh, the way we, when I first, I've been at my school for six years and what we found out that there was no consistency with behavior. Uh, so what we did is we created a discipline team um, and we, I started off by, I took them out to, to lunch one day. I said, write down you know, on a sticky note, every behavior that would occur for, um, and then she would send a student out of class for. And so they did. And so then we, as a team, then uh, tiered them and said, what would be something we would say would definitely have to be suspendable? What would be something that we'd say a parent contact would have? So then if you see right here in parentheses, this is what it corresponds to with educator's handbook. Educator's handbook is what we use that corresponds with the uh, state codes for suspensions or write-ups or things like that. Uh, so like refusing to work, we said that would be in subordination. And so for that, we said, these are the consequences that you would have. This is very elementary that you would do, but this is something you would need to also do at a high school level. So that, that is one thing I wanna say for high school people, just because you're high school doesn't mean that you stop doing things systematically and procedurally. And that's a lot of times what happens in a high school is that um, in my opinion, sometimes high school teachers feel like they're mini professors and they don't need to do all these things, but it's very important uh, for us uh, what needs to happen. Anyway, and then the, it goes through each behavior and we tiered them. And then we gave the definitions of what actually it actually is for aggressive behavior, bullying, fighting, all that. Uh, we have a specific cell phone uh, pay, uh, policy. Well, I'll be honest, and for me, very controversial, we take up phones at the class periods. We ask the kids to uh, take them up, put them, the, a lot of our teachers have uh, cell phone cases and things like that. Um, cell phones are a huge distraction in our school. 
Um, it causes a lot of our students do not know how to behave appropriately on uh, the media. You know, they'll a lot of things stem from cell phones. Um, and then our tardy policy that we have. And then we also are PBIS. This is our bolt matrix. Um, this goes, uh, you know, be respectful, obey, learn, take responsibility. Um, I'm very um, systematic, like I've said. Um, we, our last, our first five days of each semester, I expect uh, each teacher for every single class period to do an anchor chart with their student, meaning that when you start your class, first period, you say to the students, what does be respectful mean in this classroom? What does it look like? And then that's how they develop their classroom rules. So when I go by each classroom, I expect to see, because they have three class periods, they're, one's a planning, that they've done this bolt matrix uh, with each class. And the kids, by the time they get the four periods, we're like, we know, take responsibility. Don't, they'll say that. Um, but that's just what we do, because we feel that our students uh, need to know what it means to obey the rules. What does it mean to take responsibility? Uh, so we're very um, systematic in the way we do um, those types of things. All right, do you wanna add any, where would you like me to go, Dr. Miraglia, then we keep on rolling. Why don't we look at the EC discipline procedures since you were just talking about behaviors? Okay. And as you're looking to move into administration, I think one of the um, one of the most important lessons for you to take in is understanding how discipline works differently for students who are EC or if they're Section 504. And so I've I've included this PowerPoint in our resources for you because you you can get yourself into some serious trouble if you're not following these laws. Um, of course, there's laws regarding instruction for EC students or Section 504 students, but then there's also this part that falls under the umbrella as well. And what I've tried to do here is lay out for you, um, they're very similar, but there's a few differences as well. But for 504, it's very important that you do not want to exclude them from from, from anything or deny them any of their rights. You don't want to discriminate. With EC students, you need to make sure that all students have available to them a free and appropriate public education. And you have to ensure that their rights, children with disabilities, their rights, the rights of them and their parents are protected. And so some of you as teachers may have seen situations where you've had, for example, two, two students get into a fight and they may not get the same consequence. And that can be really hard to stomach sometimes, and I understand that. But with EC children, you have 10 days within a school year that you can suspend them. And anything beyond that, you have to have a meeting kind of manifestation determination. And I, there's also in this, this Google folder, I've included a handout that um, talks about a manifestation determination. And that's where you have an IEP meeting and the team comes together with the parent and you have to try and determine, um, that's actually for requesting a discipline team meeting. We can go back to the PowerPoint, but you have a manifestation determination meeting and that's where you have to determine is this behavior tied to the child's disability? If they have ADHD, a fight might not necessarily be tied to that. However, if they have ODD and they've been disrespectful to a teacher, then you may be able to say that this is a manifestation and we can't suspend. So when you're looking at those 10 days, you need to be very strategic, very deliberate in how you use those because if you end up using up all your days in one shot, and, and this kid is, is manifesting something from his disability, then you're gonna have a problem. But if, if you have a child who is manifesting his disability, then you need to ha be having a conversation about that as well. You don't need to just have a manifestation determination. You need to sit down with the IEP team and talk about, okay, why is this kid struggling? What do we need to do? What, what can we put in place to try to support this child and help this child be more successful? So if you do have some repeated behaviors, you've got a whole other issue you need to look at. Dr. Mariah, can I get you to stop your screen share? I want to give a quick pop quiz. 
Sure. All right. Dr. Miraglia said, um, so Cyrus is getting ready to ask a question here. Let me see what Cyrus's question is. 504 and EC, EC are the same, yeah, in terms of this law. All right, so that is correct. So Cyrus- As well as McKinney-Vento. Yeah, McKinney-Vento, you're homeless. And, they're, and that's, they're all, that's one that easily slips through the cracks. So make yeah. sure you remember that one too. Uh, there's actually four. EC, 504, McKinney-Vento, and students who are referred in your intervention also get yes. the same rights as if they're already placed into one of those other programs. Let me say that again. If you've got a kid that's been referred to your intervention team, they get the same, they get the same protections as EC 504 and McKinney Vento. So that actually makes four groups that, that these that these exemptions apply to. Now, so the pop quiz is Dr. Miraglia said you can only suspend an EC kid for up to 10 days in the school year. If you go past that, you got to do a manifestation determination, a functional behavior assessment, update their psychological and their IEP, and do a deck five. All right, you got to do all that paperwork. It takes about two weeks to do all that stuff. So my question to you is, and anybody can chime in, what about in-school suspension? Does that count against the 10 days? Yes or no? Kitty? Is Cammie Thank says you. yes. Is Cammie right? Cammie is right. Yay. So Cami answers the first question, the first of the pop quizzes tonight. Cami is correct. Anytime you change that kid's placement um, and they're not receiving instruction, that is correct from Heather, that, that is a change of placement and that counts against you 10 days. What about a bus suspension? Mm -hmm. That would count as well. All right. So now Dr. Ragley has also said something else in here. Here's the, here's the second part of the pop quiz. I've got this kid over here and he's just a pain in my, you know, somewhere in, in my backside. He's just, he does the same thing every day. So what I'm doing is, is I'm just giving him one day of suspension. I'm being judicious. Uh, I, what, what he's doing basically is, is he's, uh, <clears throat> he is using profanity in class and he's doing it every day. So I'm just, you know, I'm giving him one day at a time. How many times can I give him that one day for the same infraction before he skips to the head of the line? He, you know, he doesn't pass go, doesn't click. He goes straight to, you know, to the head of the line and he gets a manifest determination. How many times does he have to do the same, the same behavior before the 10 days is no longer null, it's now null and void, and we have to move them directly to the manifest determination. How many, how many times, what, what is the magic number? That would be the third time that the kid exhibits the exact same behavior, regardless of how many days, how judicious we've been. What Dr. Miraglia was talking about, he's tardy, you know, or, or if he's disrespectful or if he's fired, yeah. but now if he's doing the same thing over and over again, isn't that a pattern? Mm -hmm. And if they're showing a pattern of behavior, especially if it's harassment, bullying, or anything sexual, the third time is the charm. Doesn't matter if you've only suspended him two days. Now we had a high school principal in Charlotte that got in trouble over this. Uh, he was meeting out one day at a time and the kid was continuing to do commit sexual infractions. And basically the, the, the parents of the victims complained. And, and his argument was, is, you know, yeah, he's done this eight times, but I still got two more days, you know, that I've got to play with. He can do, two, do this two more times. And so he had allowed this particular kid to commit eight sexual infractions uh, and had not ever moved that kid for a manifestation determination to see if this was a part of his disability eight times he in one school year that he had committed a sexual infraction on that campus at, I won't say I won't say Vance High School but it could have been Vance High School um, eight times now do you, would you like to be the, the administrator that represents the district in court 
and explain why you had a knucklehead principal that allowed this kid to commit eight sexual infractions and had yet to do a manifestation determination on this kid. <clears throat> that's, one of the, that's one of the pleasures in life you'd like to avoid. I can tell you from personal experience, you'd like not to have to do that. Um, the judge seems to have no sense of humor when you, when you bring cases like that before them. Uh, that makes them mad. Um, and so I'm making light of a very serious situation here. One of the things that unfortunately I've seen too many times is, is not counting bus suspensions, not counting in-school suspensions, doing what's known as therapeutic suspension, where you send the kid home for the rest of the day. That's illegal, by the way. Let me, let me say that again so everybody, I, I want to be clear. Therapeutic suspension is illegal. You cannot send a kid home for the rest of the day and not count that as anything. That got, has got to go into the discipline track. It's got to be entered into power school just like anything else. There is no such thing as therapeutic suspension. That is, that is, that is incorrect. And so, yes, you want to be judicious with your days and not use all 10 of them to begin with. But you also, when you see a pattern of, of the same behavior on the third time, that's, that's Yahtzee, that's bingo. We've got to start the process. Remember, we have to answer to the victim's parents and to the victims as well of these, of, of these infractions. That there's two sides to this coin. Yes, students who are, you know, we'll talk about next, you know, next week is our case study and I'll cover that last tonight, but the week after that, we're gonna to get to due process and our standards are arbitrary and capricious. Uh, and we we'll also talk about FERPA where we can't discuss, you know, so me and Dr. Bragg will get caught out behind the building smoking. Um, they bring, bring us back in and they send her on the class and they just shoot me. Well, that would be, that would be arbitrary. She got no punishment, I got the maximum. And it would be capricious, you know, uh, shooting me over smoking is a little bit much. Uh, and, and so that's both arbitrary and capricious. But when my parents come in, they can't talk about, you can't talk to my parents about why Dr. Miraglia didn't get anything because that would be violating her, her FERPA rights, you know, to, to privacy. So there, there's a lot of things factoring into this discipline of exceptional children's, but the big yard, don't you can't talk with other people you have to go by the standards of arbitrary and capricious like everybody else. And as Dr. Miraglia pointed out, you get an EC and a non-EC kid in the same infraction, they may not get the same punishment based on their IEP, the manifestation, those things. But the bigger issue is, remember, bus suspension, in-school suspension can't sound, counts the same as out on your 10 days, three times is a pattern, and there is no such thing as a therapeutic suspension. If you'll remember those things, when you go to court, you won't get embarrassed. And you will have to go eventually, but you, but you won't get embarrassed. Okay. Arbitrary and capricious is in our school law book. The reading for that is, is a third. When we get to that, if you look at our weekly schedule, it references the chapter for that reading. That's the two standards that we're going to be, be looking at uh, for our case study next week. When we're looking at, you know, we'll cheating strike Bobby out. You need, to, you need to think about those standards. You can do that reading. So if you'll, if, you'll look at, if you'll look at the following week, if you'll look at due process, the chapters, if you'll read those, that will help you with your case study as well when we get to that. But these are some practical things, some legal things that go along with working and dealing with exceptional children, special populations that you, that you have to know that are good, that are good things to remember that will keep you from losing your house in a, in a lawsuit. All right, back to back to the to the experts. Okay, Dr. Magley, let me go back to your presentation. You're muted, honey. You're muted. Yeah. Yes, and then I'll just point out a few things and then I know you wanted to talk about scheduling and we can talk about, I can share a few other resources. Okay. All right, I got you. Okay, you can keep going. And again, this is just sort of what we've already been talking about. Any student who is currently identified, and remember, 
It is 504, it's EC, but McKinney Vento and any child who has been identified as going through the pro or going through the intervention process, they get the same um, the same rights when it comes to discipline. And one thing about McKinney Vento, and I'm actually not sure if this is my something from my district or Dr. Lamb, or if this is statewide, but I know from McKinney Vento students there is a particular form that we have to fill out if we are looking at potential uh, suspension and we have to determine if their homelessness is impacting their behavior. Basically, is the behavior a manifestation of them being homeless? Yeah, that, that's the standard form. Okay, that was just, since I've only been in one district, I was not sure about that. But just McKinney-Vento is one that can be so easily overlooked and so another thing I would recommend to you is have yourself a checklist when you get into an administrative position that if a student is coming to you and you are looking at suspension, you need to just make sure that it becomes inherent in how you handle things. Is this kid EC, is this kid 504 on down the line so you don't find yourself in a situation that, um, you, you've suspended for too long, you've not had an MDR, whatever the case may be, but that just needs to be something that becomes inherently a part of how you do business. Um, and you can see here, again, I'm not going to read all this to you because we did give it to you so you would have it as, uh, so you could go back and refer to it. But an EC child, oh, that's fine, keep going. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. The manifestation determination review process. We've already talked about this to a degree. This needs to, unless there is a pattern of behavior, as Dr. Lamb said, with three uh, instances of the behavior occurring, the, the manifestation needs to occur on the 11th cumulative day of OSS or it could be ISS, bus suspension. If a school is looking for a long-term removal or an alternative setting, if a school is re requesting a discipline team meeting, which in our district, we have discipline team meetings. So if we're gonna be talking about a child, if we're recommending a child be sent to an alternative setting and you can see, or when a school plans to give a student out of school suspension that's fewer than 10 days, but when combined with previous suspension days in the current school year would exceed 10 days. So that's something you also need to keep track of as well. Make sure that you always go back and look at, okay, how many days has this kid already been suspended? And it might be for different behaviors. You know, you might have some insubordination, you may have some classroom disruption and then the kid gets in a fight. We'll go back and look and see how many days has this kid been put out of school or been put in ISS because that can also catch you as well. So that's why I think if you make yourself a cheat sheet, a little checklist when you first start out so you can kind of get these things under your belt, that could be very helpful to you. That was something I did because I just did not want to screw this up because you're talking about federal law. And you've got to have it within 10 days of the suspension. And you don't wait till the ninth day. That's another thing that I have had principals. Well, don't schedule that until the ninth day so we can get every possible day. No, you can't play that game. And, and don't, don't get caught in that. And you can see here notification procedures. Sorry. That's okay. Um, the meeting must, again, the meeting must occur notification procedures, what you have to do and the differences between the, the two uh, different groups of students. You can keep going because I'm, I'm not going to read all this to them. I want them to be able to go back and have it as a reference. And then what you're going to consider is the nature of the student's disability if it is a manifestation and is the student's plan being implemented? That's gonna be another big question as well. Is that IEP being implemented in the classroom, whether it's academic goals, behavioral goals, that's a question that, because if it's not being implemented, then it's gonna be automatically a manifestation of the student's disability.
And here's a scenario, a student with a disability exhibits a behavior or engages in misconduct, which results in an out of school dis suspension. Was the conduct in question caused by the student's disability? And did the conduct in question have a relationship to the disability? Again, an example here would be asthma. Like I said, with um, ADHD, sometimes that is not necessarily a manifestation. It just depends on the specific child. But, um, you know, if it's a other health impaired, most of the time with something like that, you're not going to think that you're not going to say it's a manifestation. But ODD, that one's always going to is going to come up with being a manifestation or a serious emotional disability. And you need to consider all relevant information. Of course, the plan, the current behavior plan, if there is one in place, what the teacher has observed, any, any relevant information needs to be considered. And again, going back to, is this a pattern of behavior? And if you do determine that it's a manifestation, the suspension ends immediately. The student is allowed to return to school the next day. You cannot proceed with any other disciplinary procedures. For example, if you were wanting to request a, a, change, a placement in an alternative school, that you cannot proceed with that. You would adjust the student's attendance in power school. So that's a really important piece as well, that you're, you're constantly collaborating with your attendance secretary because typically when a student gets suspended, say for five days, you put that end of power school and power school reflects that. Well, on the second day of the suspension, you have your, de your manifestation and you determine it is a manifestation. You need to go back into power school and remove those remaining days. That's very important as well. And you have to in ensure your FBA is current and that your behavior plan is uh, where it needs to be. The school administration, if it's not a manifestation, you can continue with the suspension. You can request a DTM and the functional behavior assessment and the BIP is not required, but should be considered if appropriate. And then the EC teacher would complete the MDR paperwork in ECAT and your 504 coordinator would complete any information there that they would be responsible for. The administrator is gonna be handling the actual discipline paperwork, but the, the, you, your EC case manager would handle any paperwork that is specifically going into ECATS, okay? And then a failure to develop and, and progress monitor is a violation of Section 504 and IDEA. So please be very well aware of that. Some common errors. Again, if the, if the IEP is not being implemented, if the 504 plan is not being implemented, you, know, you, need, you gotta make sure your teachers have copies of all of that. There's no progress monitoring. If required team members are not there, um, just last week, I had a very important IEP meeting and the general education teacher was there and he popped out. We were on Zoom and he didn't come and he didn't come. And I will say that I lost a degree of my professionalism with him because they need to be there no matter what. But this was a particularly sticky one. And you've got to make sure all your people are there. Don't proceed if you don't have your gen ed teacher. Don't proceed if you don't have your EC teacher, which you really couldn't even do that without the EC teacher because I certainly couldn't do ECATS. But you just need to make sure everybody's present and that you've made every, op every, you've made every effort to try to get that parent there as well. And just some more errors. And... Dr. Caton, if you want to talk about scheduling a little bit, and then I can come back and talk about a few other things, because I know that, that was something that was going to be really important. Sure. Okay. So um, for me, am I on mute or no? I'm good. Okay, cool. 
So um, for me, I've talked a little bit about um, skinnies at our school. Uh, first of all, I would like to tell you that at Aiden Grifton, um, my master's schedule is built around uh, many different things. Um, it's built around our EC students. Um, it is built around our freshman academy. It is built around, we're going to start an AP academy next semester. And it's also built around uh, our sophomore academy. So we have a lot of things going on. And we're a small school. We only have 653 students. Um, so the first thing that uh, I, what I do is that um, all of our students are screened. Um, and we do language. I don't know if any of you have heard it or corrective reading. And so all of our students, here they are, and this is their level or their uh, of, for reading. And if you notice, there are 11th graders and 12th graders and 10th graders that are all in this group one. Um, this is the level that they're on and the lesson that they're on for uh, corrective reading. So if you see, they're also, this is, here's a student right here who's the occupational course of study. Now, for us, when you see our schedule, um, it will say uh, curriculum assistance. Uh, I don't know what everybody calls it, but that's what we call it. It's year long, it's in a skinny. Uh, all of our, most of our students need to have a reading goal and a math goal. There are some, very few, that only have just a math goal. Uh, even if they only have just a math goal, you can still give them reading services. And the way you, you can see if they need reading, so like for example, if a student is only uh, math, LD and math. If you screen them and they have reading deficiencies, you still can give them reading services. So that's something that your IEP team needs to consider based on that student's level. If they're below grade level in reading, you can do that. Just because they're LD and just math, it doesn't mean that you have to only give them uh, math services. So that's really important. So what we do is our, we build our curriculum assistance schedule around the levels for reading. It's easier, it's well, reading levels are more specific and pretty much all of our students for math are about the same. Um, so this is very specific about the groups that we have for every student, okay? So I just wanted to show you that's the first step that we do. We make sure that all of our students that we currently have are screened before the end of the school year. Well, they're screened out throughout, but we do one final, and then we make sure that any incoming eighth grader, coming incoming ninth grader is screened as well. So we know exactly where they are. Okay, so then what we do is we then do our schedule for our EC students. So it's a schedule within our schedule. This is our EC schedule. Let, this is a skinny that I'm getting ready to show you. Crumpler, she is our direct instruction. So DI is direct instruction. This student is a standard course of study student. He gets direct instruction. She is my math direct instruction student, our teacher. So this is group A. So this is the first half of first period. This is group B. This is the second half of first period. So if you see right here, Xavier, he has the first half. He's in this group for uh, math. And then he goes over to Ms. McCool, who's my reading special teacher for direct instruction and gets the second half of his skinny for reading. All these students, when you go back to the, the levels of McCool are the same exact kids. Here they all are. And then that's me that placed them into this class, first period based off their level. So these kids go from this teacher here over to this teacher here. How does it happen? The teacher literally, they're uh, right uh, pretty much down the hall from each other. The teacher just pretty much walks them like little ducklings or you know, into their classroom and they transition themselves. Um, so that's what they do. Um, this is a way, I know that many schools in North Carolina were not given curriculum assistance year long, um, especially for, they would just fit it into their schedule. That's against the law. Um, so they said to you know, high schools, you have to be creative about what you do. Um, I'm an EC person. So this is what I decided we would do to make sure our students got what they needed. Then if you notice that this, this, these groups of students here, this is a second period uh, for English. There are some occupational course of students in this class, as well as some students who are standard course of study. They're all getting curriculum, they're all getting direct instruction of corrective reading. They all are on the same level, every single one of them. However, this student is getting an English one credit for uh, English, and this student is on that level, and he's getting his English um, four uh, credit. That's confusing as all get out, I'm pretty sure. So does anybody have any questions about that? Because that 
kind of shows you uh, how we look not at the course, but the need of the students, our EC students, to make sure they're being served as they need, uh, they, they get the services that they need. Any questions about that? Okay. It, go ahead. I'm sorry, you're ready to go say something, I think. No, I was just going to say we, we do something very similar in middle school, but our students are, and, and we're going to try something a little bit different this coming year. With COVID, all of our EC children were in inclusion, mm -hmm. and we're going to continue with that this year, and the children who need some extra support, we're going to provide that through their uh, science and social studies. Um, we don't we don't really group according to reading, as you said, you did. We, we kind of come at it from a math standpoint, but it's more because our um, multi-classroom lead teacher in math has the, he works with the sixth and the seventh graders. So he has known these children over an extended period of time. And of course the IEP is guiding it, but when we start getting input, he is very heavy with his input. And so we start from a math standpoint, but, but you can start from either the math or the literacy. Um, but your skinnies, that's what we're, we are doing anyway. We're probably one of the only middle schools in our district that we have 55 minute classes. Uh, we do not do any block scheduling because we did not feel that that was uh, working effectively for us. And we have really seen a lot of improvement once we made that change into uh, the kids have it, the, all, all of their classes every day for the entire year. And then we start adding in some math and literacy support based on what we see in EVOS. Right. So for us, freshman academy students are identified through EVOS. I take my lowest uh, 80 students. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see, it says FA, that's freshman academy. I don't have it mapped so you can totally see it. Baker, she'll have a freshman academy math one. So these students will go from math, you know, half math one, and she is paired right here with a leadership class. So leadership is our class where they do small group tutoring. Um, so we'll, we have a reading specialist that goes into leadership. They also do SEL uh, lessons with our guidance counselor. They also do uh, math small group uh, within that classroom. Um, there is kind of like a hodgepodge of everything within that leadership class. They all, then they also, it, it's also paired up. If you see right here, here's Earth Science Freshman Academy. And then social studies, there's your world history where it's paired up there. We also have um, AVID, which is another, um, you know, a parent is kind of skinny as well. If you see that Coach Moy here, he actually has AVID one the first half and AVID three the second half. And he's paired, paired up with my English teacher. And that's why this right here says Wood honors English one, honors English three, because that's that pairing there. Uh, so we have a lot of skinnies and we're the only high school that does skinnies as well in our county. Um, so and it does take a very creative um, planning uh, or you know creative master scheduling. Um, notice also that um, with ours that uh, fourth period planning is what we do for our freshman academy. They all have the same uh, planning period. We do the same for our sophomore academy as well. So that kind of shows you our master schedule. Don't ask me for this year's. We're not there yet. We're working on it. Got to drive me insane because. I, I add a lot of, um, I make it difficult, I think, because I, I'm very specific about things I want, you know, based on our student needs. So um, anyway, okay, let me see where we're at. So help me out. Let's see. So, oh, I wanted to also talk to you about um, uh, one more other thing is that for us at our school, um, this is my teaming structures. I set up for everybody to be on a team. Uh, this is set, of course, that's, uh, you know, that's the law that it has to be voted on. This is leadership. We have problem solving. We have a discipline committee. These are our beginning teachers. These are people who has on the work keys, ACT or PLCs that we have going on. Um, and then who our EC teachers are. We try to make sure uh, we have everybody on a specific team so that of course, uh, standard uh, one leadership we want uh, everybody to be on some kind of team. So we try to spread the love around and being a small school, that's a big thing. I also wanted to share with you about 
ESL students, remember that with ESL students, um, that you, if an ESL student is, does not pass a class, you have to submit appropriate paperwork as to why they didn't. And I don't know if any of you have looked at an ESL accommodation form. They are so much more intense than what an IEP uh, accommodation and modifications are. And if you notice, this is ours. And if I go down here and this teacher has not remotely touched on all of those accommodations or modifications that the student has within their classroom, then I will waive that failing grade um, to be passing um, because legally they have not um, accommodated that student. So um, usually uh, ESL accommodations are more intense than what a student um, with disabilities are. All right, where would you like me to go, Dr. Maraglia? Um, the IEP review. Something else I included because I know that you were to uh, participate in an IEP meeting, and if you if you didn't get that chance, even if you did, I would highly recommend when the school year gets going that you make a point to try to participate in some additional meetings because I can guarantee you once you become an assistant principal, that's going to fall to you on a regular basis, and you need to get as well versed as you can in the meetings um, because you would be acting as the LEA and you want to know what you're talking about. You want to be able to make the right decisions. You don't want to promise something that your district can't or that your school can't provide. And what I included here, um, this is a checklist for the case manager, but I thought you might find it helpful. Um, and, and this is just to make sure that the EC case manager is going through the process and what it needs to look like. And, and you might even want to take this into a meeting with you and, and see, okay, is the case manager doing all these things that he or she is supposed to do? Um, for example, at the, at the beginning of the meeting, this sounds maybe like a no brainer, but everyone should be introduced and explain what their role is um, and identifying any time constraints reminding people to turn off their phones, things of that nature. And then, and then the whole process of how they go through the IEP and how they talk about it, making sure parents are given copies of all the meeting documents. So I, I thought this might be helpful for you. And then on the, the second page of this is just a draft agenda. And again, just to help you start being able to navigate the waters. I hope as a, as a teacher, you've at least had the opportunity to participate in IEP meetings through that role. But it's very possible that some of you might not have. And I can think back to when I was a teacher and some of the IEP meetings I, sit, I sat in and I was absolutely clueless. I really was. Um, because this was just not something that um, you, you learn about when you're, when you're taking your teacher ed programs and you're gonna come at it from a different, totally different perspective now and just to, to be able to get comfortable in that role. And so again, this might be something just so you can learn to take with you and to see if, of course you can see if things are being handled appropriately, but then again, just for your learning and edification. And I think that was everything that I had, Dr. Caton. I think that's all we had, um, Dr. Lamb. Okay, right on time. Y'all have to finish up a couple minutes early. Well, all I right, would also so. like to say that in, in your resource folder, Dr. Lamb, on Blackboard, there was a Jen's top 10. Yes. And if they haven't had a chance to look at that, I, I think that I found that very interesting as well. I mean, I know her number one was in 2006, USA, USA um, Today said that there were 10 million children, EC children in our country. And I just looked it up to see what the latest stats were. And in 2019, 2020, it was about seven about 7.9 million, 7.3 million. So it's about 14% of our population. And, and that's, that's a large number of children. And so this is going to be touching your life as an administrator on a daily basis. Right. Yeah. 15% of our, our students. 
but that but, but that's an average that's right. as you know, absolutely um you could have 30 percent in some schools and five percent in others mm -hmm. um some of you work in larger districts where there is some sort of a pupil assignment plan uh, and others of you work in districts where they just draw attendance boundaries um, and that's inherent that you know I'll use it for an example one of the rural districts that I worked in in the western part of the state is like most rural districts there you know there's a hundred counties in North Carolina and they all have a county seat and generally the high school in the county seat has the children of the doctors lawyers and Indian chiefs um, because the courthouse is there, the hospital is there, you know, and usually the nicer neighborhood for industry is in, around the county seat. Well, that high school will will have 5% EC. Now, we're not talking about gifted, we're talking about on the other end of the spectrum. They'll have about 5%, whereas, but what that means is if we know that the average is 15, that means that the, the lower end school, you know, where, uh, the economic disparities have hit in other parts of the county, they'll have 30% of their kids are EC. And so you say, well, I wanna work in that and it only has 5%, but then you gotta deal with those parents of those AI, of those AI, AIG kids. Uh, and I'd rather have heartburn than to deal with them. So, you know, it's pay me now or pay me later. You're gonna be dealing with exceptional children one end of the spectrum of the other every day. It's gonna be an everyday thing. So um, we're not telling you that you can learn all this stuff overnight. That's not the point. The point is to know what you don't know that you're gonna have to learn this stuff when you get on the job, but be very careful. There's so many rules and regulations. Now, I know this, that this sounds crazy, um, but, but EC is relatively new. When I say relatively new, uh, exceptional children's programs are only 41 years old. Now I know for you, some of you folks who aren't even 41 years of age, some of us have been in the business longer than that. Uh, remembering that um, this stuff is still evolving. But my point is that exceptional children has not been around since the inception of public education. It's only relatively new the last 41 years since 1975. And it continues to evolve. To evolve. Uh, and as our society evolves with different cultural aspects, some people call it woke culture or whatever. As more and more people's rights emerge, this grows and changes and shifts as well. And you, you've got to be aware that you've got to stay on top of it. It's got to be an everyday thing. You can't just dabble into it. You, you, you're going to have to get to know. All right. So let's talk about our first case study that's due next week. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a little bit of extra here tonight. Um, in our law book, um, I would suggest looking um, at page 202. Um, we're talking about reasonable punishment, but the standards of arbitrary and capricious. You can you can look those up in Bulldog One Search. Those are actual legal terms. Our book uses a little bit, but but arbitrary and capricious simply means most of that's going to be in your code of conduct for your district. Arbitrary is does every you know do we treat everybody the same or do we do we let some people slide, um, and then then capricious is is do we follow the the standards? So when you look at a code of conduct, uh, and I'm going to look at one. Let me share my screen. We're going to look at a code of conduct right quick. I just Google this, so hopefully it'll work. I just did it on my phone to make sure. Let me log out of this. And I just Googled this and it works. So let's see, there, see it pop right up, look at that. All right, so what we're talking about when we talk about capricious is um, giving more punishment than the, than, than the handbook calls for. So what you're gonna see in a tiered system of this one, this is every district has one of these. They're required by law to have, the board has to adopt a code of conduct that interprets all, all of the due process rights and, and, and law, discipline laws for the state that puts this out. And we'll, we'll talk about that week after next. But, but my point is when we talk about 
being capricious. Let me get to number nine here. There's a level system that says this infraction is this level, level one. And it says what the minimum that you can do and the maximum that you can do. And if you do more than the maximum allowable, that would be capricious. That's not a reasonable punishment. That's what our book talks about. It talks about these standards. So again, page 202, page 160, and page 145. So I would start reading it about 145 through due process, and you'll finish somewhere around about page 205. So it's about 60 pages. Take you about 30 minutes to read it. Um, but it covers arbitrary, capricious, reasonable punishment, um, zero tolerance, which is illegal. You know, you can't, you can't just, if you do this, you get kicked out of school. Um, but it, it sets apart what the, the, the parameters for, for punishing, for assigning consequences to students. All right, so what we're looking at specifically um, is rule six, which uh, cheating honor code violation. And so we can see that the minimum is a level one, refer to page nine, uh, and the maximum would be level two. Uh, the problem is, is this is the student's first time around on, on this one. And so the, the maximum um, would be a level two, no matter what, would be one to five days out of school suspension. And so we look at what the, the actual levels are about what should happen. And basically a level one infraction that this is would be um, a conference or an in-school suspension um, would be the appropriate for a, a child at this age. And so what we're looking at in our, in our case study is the appropriate level of punishment would be from a parent conference to an in-school suspension for a child cheating on a class assignment. Uh, and so what happens with Bobby is, is um, Bobby's politically connected. Do we arbitrarily say we're going to let Bobby off or do we hold Bobby accountable? Or the, the other side of that is, is are we giving Bobby too much punishment? So what has happened, and let me go to that. So what has happened on this particular one, let me move that out of the way. And this is our case study one. Bobby gets caught cheating and admits that he turned in his brother's work on a class assignment. The teacher's response is, is to count the class assignment for more than 50% of his yearly grade and fail him for the year. She fails him for the year over cheating on a class assignment. And even though he is offered the option of summer school, he is offered the option of summer school rather than repeating the eighth grade. Uh, that still classifies as an illegal zero tolerance. He's, he's expelled for a year. He's, he's excluded for an entire year. Or even, and even if he has to go to a summer school, it still doesn't change the fact that for cheating on a class assignment, he was failed for the year. And so what you have to decide, is that, is that a reasonable, does, it, does that fit within the confines of arbitrary and capricious? Is, is, is failing for the year an appropriate punishment for cheating on a class assignment? Or should we just let him go because he's politically connected? I mean, where, where, what is the sweet spot here? So that's what you're being asked to decide. Now, we, we also need to address the teacher's behavior. Uh, we all know that it's illegal to count a class assignment for more than half of the school grade. That's not, that's not, that didn't even begin to, to sound reasonable. How much can you count a class assignment? Well, the North and South Carolina both defined that the most that any assignment can count, that's the state exam is 30% and both of them only counted 20. How is it the state exam can only count 20% by state law and a class assignment that should count for less than one point on the yearly grade counts for more than 50% of the yearly grade. 
Do you think the teacher might have manipulated the grade system? Do you think that a veteran teacher didn't know the grade system? These are all questions that you've got to ask. What do you do about a teacher who does something like this? Is this something that's actionable against the teacher? Has the teacher violated the law? Or do you just assume the teacher didn't know? But, uh, you know, my, my, my hint here, and you know, I'm giving you the extra clues on this one. It would not be reasonable to exclude a student for an entire year over class cheating on a class assignment. That would be the same as taking me out back and shooting me over smoking. Um, that would be that, that that would be akin to something that that extreme. Um, but you've got to figure out what what should the punishment be? What what should we do with the teachers? Do, do we this notion? Do we always support teachers in public and then talk to them about it in private? I mean, you know, hopefully y'all 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 aren't that dumb. Um, if you don't, you know, y'all got y'all got to step up the game. If you're going, you know, you got to be smarter than that. If you're going to hang out with us. This notion that we always support teachers all the time in public, but then we'll talk to them about it in private. No, didn't your mama tell you if your friend jumped off a roof, would you jump off with them? Because they violated the law, would you do that as well? Would you double down on, on that? I mean, that's double dumbassery. Would you double down on breaking the law? Um, if, if just because your teacher did, would you go along with that? These are the kinds of things that, that you need you need to think about. This is, this is real life scenario here. But you need to be rooted in law. I have a lot of folks who, you know, well, Bobby, you know, Bobby's a turd. You know, he did this. And yeah, Bobby's probably a turd. I acknowledge that Bobby's probably a turd. Uh, that's, as we all know, education, that's a, that's a clinical term in education. Bobby's a handful. We, we, we will freely acknowledge that Bobby's a handful. But, but does that mean that we should be able to exclude Bobby for a year for cheating on a class assignment just because? Bobby's full of himself because of all of his political connections. These are things that we, we must follow the law. Now, this all centers back on 115 C 288 that was under our original night's lesson, lesson plan role of the principal because the very first 115 C 288 subsection A says who actually assigns grades in public school. Anybody know, this is your pop quiz for tonight to finish this up. If you know this one, you're gonna be in good shape going forward on your case study presentation. Who legally assigns grades if, when, when Kitty has a, has a class of students and, and who, who legally assigns the grades for the students in her class? Is it Kitty? Isn't it the principal? It is the principal. 115 C 288 subsection A says the principal assigns grades. That is the one thing your superintendent cannot take away from you. He cannot. That is correct. And expand on that, Dr. Caden. So if you determine that a student has not passed a course and your superintendent says, no, I'm going to change that to a passing grade, he can't, he doesn't have the authority to do so. That is your one, your one privilege is to grade and classify. Your one inalienable right is a principal. And teachers say, and, and teachers can't say to you, well, I failed this kid. And you have, you know, and, and, and no, you didn't fail anybody. The principal makes that final degrading decision. So yes, this is the same from state to state. And so that's that's the notion here is, is it's not up to the teacher to sign the grade. And no, you don't have to go along with the teacher and, and say, well, I, that was the wrong thing for you to do, but I'll support you in public. No, there's no rule anywhere other than, you know, uh, I hear this debated in the unemployment line of former principals who, who are stupid enough to believe that they always have to support their teachers no matter what they do. Well, you know, it was just, well, now, if, if they're molesting kids, will you support them on that one as well? That's also a violation of the law. Um, and so we got we got to start changing your lens. You've got to start looking at all the these case studies are designed to, for you to step out of the role as as classroom based to an administrative role. Begin to change your lens, your perspective, to view things as an administrator rather than a teacher. And the first trap that all of our students, many of our students, fall into is, is 
Administrators are supposed to support teachers no matter what, but I'm becoming an administrator. The reason I want to be an administrator is to support teachers, then you're in it for the wrong business. The reason you want to become an administrator is, is you want to facilitate kids through teachers, but that you're there for their achievement. You know, if you if you just want to manage personnel, you need to get a job over to mill or in, in some manufacturing. Your job is to see about kids. That doesn't mean that you that you that you don't care about your teachers and, and try to do the right things by them. But you can't support illegal behavior. Well, you won't do it but once. And then, then whoever your replacement is will get the chance to make that mistake twice. Um, but yeah, that's a hot topic of debate in the unemployment line. Uh, yeah, Todd says, if one of us is going under the bus, it's not going to be me. No, I'm not going with you because you jumped off the roof. I'm not jumping off with you. Uh, that, that's the whole notion here is obviously failing a kid for the year is way too much punishment for cheating on a class assignment. Again, that's a shotgun and a fly swatter would have worked just as well. Um, that, that's the notion here. Who assigns the grades? What, what is the backlash on the teacher? What would you do about the teacher who tried to pull a stunt like this? Uh, state law says you can't count. It. I mean, the most that you can count class assignments, again, this goes back to that federal law, state law, board policy. Between state law and board policy, the, the most that you can count class assignments is 10%, the most. Most places it's just five. That's for the whole year, all assignments. One individual assignment would never count more than one point on, on a yearly grade of 100. How is it you made it worth more than 50%? Did, you, did the teacher break the law? What sanctions should be for the teacher? The, these are questions that your group needs to work at through. And hopefully you're already starting your meeting. You're getting your PowerPoint together. Uh, hopefully you, 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 you get that. And so next week, the, the process will be I'll run over the weekly schedule. We'll look at what's going on. Uh, I'll spend five minutes on that. And then each group will present. You will present the same case. Now, I'll just tell you, I already figured out we want to go first. Whoever goes first, I'm unmerciful. I'll just tell you right now. Uh, I, will, I, will, <laughs> I will let all of your blood out uh, if you're not good. You know, that's, that's the way the world works. Uh, I'm toughening you up for the real world. And so whoever goes first, it's not a threat. Uh, we'll have a good time. We'll have some laughs. But now the first one gets the brunt. And each one of you will have to take your turn being first this semester. Uh, but you'll, 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 you'll have to take your whipping. If you, now, on the other hand, if you've done well, you know my, my praise will be effusive if you've done well. But if, but if you've not, uh, Drew said that they would go first. All right, Drew and Todd are going to go first. Like I said, that big man, he can't get a hold of us. We're on video. He, he must think we're still back in the old days when he can get his hands around our throat. That's, you know, the validity of a warranty is your, your ability to get your hands around the person's throat that sold it to you. Well, so I, I won't be in the room with you, but I can still wear you out over video. But I'm looking forward to it. We'll have a good time. Hopefully, it'll be a learning experience. And again, the purpose is to change your lens. The purpose of the case study is to change your lens and get you thinking your first thought as an administrator and not as a teacher. And that, that by the time that we get through this semester, we want the conversion to be complete. When, so when you hit 604, you've got to have that administrator mindset when you go to 604 for curriculum. If you don't, you'll fall into that teacher trap. You know, you won't learn curriculum from, from the administrator. You'll, you'll, you'll be thinking of it from a teacher perspective. And so we've got to change your lens this semester. We've got, we've got to change that lens over where you're looking at, at school as from the leadership, from the administrative perspective rather than the, uh, the, the teacher perspective. And so that's what our case studies are for. It's all be in good humor. We won't be too ugly. Uh, we'll have a good time. All right, so let me check our chat for questions that I might have missed. I think we've got everything here. Um, Again, start reading at page 145 and finish up at about 205, excuse me, 205. There's about 60 pages there. Again, it's easy, quick reading, um, very practical, but it will cover most of the things that you need. Uh, you, can, you can Google, you know, 
Google Scholar, arbitrary and capricious, those standards. Um, but they, they fall under the reasonableness doctrine. Arbitrary, uh, we don't treat everybody the same. We let some people off, we punish others. Capricious, we give too much punishment. Uh, we give too much punishment for the crime. It doesn't fit the crime. And next week, I'll tell you my story. The young attorney who looked like Booger from Revenge of the Nerves, I'll tell you my Booger story next week. All right, anything before we go tonight? Principals, anything to wrap up? All right, we'll see you all next Wednesday. I'm looking forward to it. Be ready to roll, seven o'clock. Everybody have a good week. Good night. Good night. Thank you.